Saturday, September 23rd, 1.10 p.m. Okay, Mr. Hewitt, go ahead and pull your van into the garage if you please, sir. Just drive straight ahead and you're good. The balding, pinch-faced man behind the wheel nodded and carefully pulled forward, craning his head out the open window so he could make sure that he didn't somehow drive one of the front wheels into the pit. Eddie Paulson was well aware that most licensed mechanics wouldn't allow the customer to drive their own vehicle into the shop for insurance reasons, but he didn't actually have a license, or insurance for that matter, so he wasn't terribly worried about it. Back in his father's day, every farmer and rural mechanic had a pit in their barn or garage, but they'd been outlawed years ago. Too many idiots had gassed themselves to death by working beneath a vehicle as it was still running. These days, a mechanic was required by law to use a hydraulic lift, or at the very least, four reliable jack stands. Eddie could potentially get into some hot water over having one on his property, but if it came down to it, the sons of bitches were more than welcome to seize his assets and all the arrears that came with them. He would pack whatever he could into his aging pickup truck in the middle of the night and drive off without a shred of regret. Eddie listened to the van's engine and shook his head. When he'd asked John Hewitt what the problem was over the phone, Hewitt had vaguely replied, The engine's getting a bit noisy. I think it needs a tune-up. This particular statement, in Eddie's experience, often meant that either the timing was off or the oil was dirty and probably too low. The loud, thirsty grumbling that Eddie heard coming from beneath the caravan's hood told him that it was the latter. Oil change, maybe scrub the gunk out of the pan. Easy money. As the caravan's back bumper disappeared into the garage, a second vehicle rocked and jounced its way into Eddie's potholed gravel driveway. It was another van. This one was a later model, full-size GMC cargo van with tinted windows. There was a tiny, bird-like woman perched in the driver's seat. She pulled up in front of the garage and Eddie strolled over to see what her story was. The woman saw that he was approaching and scurried out to meet him. She was wearing a dark, modest dress and clunky square-toed shoes, the official outfit of the rural church lady. Her lank hair framed a gruesome-looking black eye. Eddie's brow furrowed as he examined it. She'd been hit with tremendous force and was probably lucky that her eye socket hadn't been shattered. Ouch, who's been boxing on you, lady? Hello, you're Mr. Paulson? I'm Debbie Hewitt. Debbie offered a limp, skeletal hand and Eddie took it carefully into his own grease-smeared paw. She noticed that he was staring at the swollen black circle that surrounded her left eye and tried to hide it with her hair. We have a few errands to run while you're working on the van. We'll be gone for a couple of hours, I guess. Will that be long enough for you to finish what needs to be done? Yes, ma'am. I think that should be just enough time. Eddie grinned, and he felt bad, but not too bad. He only charged 30 bucks an hour. Licensed mechanics charged an arm and a leg. There were plenty of guys out there who would gleefully inflict far worse damage to this trusting, vehicle maintenance impaired couple's bank account than Eddie Paulson. Far, far worse. What the hell happened to your eye? The mister doesn't look like he has it in him, but... But it was none of his business, was it? Fixing cars was his business. Staying afloat in a sea of debt was his business. Eddie gave Debbie a reassuring smile and tried his best not to look at the dark, nasty bruising around her eye socket. She attempted to smile back and could only manage a strained, tired grimace. The warm September breeze gusted and blew Debbie's hair back, and Eddie's smile froze on his face. Most of her right ear was missing. Removed. Gone. All that remained was her earlobe, a few mangled ridges of cartilage, and a gaping hole. Paulson stared at it in horror. The scar tissue was hideous. Holy fuck, lady. Your ear... The mechanic was startled back to his senses by the sound of the minivan's door slamming shut. 
John Hewitt came out of the garage, clutching a precarious double armful of children's toys and books. His smile still frozen in place. Eddie said, You've got kids, I see. The gusting breeze dwindled, and Mrs. Hewitt's fine, fluttering hair dropped, mercifully, to cover what was left of her ear. She hesitated, squirmed uncomfortably, then abruptly blurted out, Yes, uh, we have a son. His name is Charlie. He has trouble pronouncing that, so we just call him Arlie. Oh? How old's the lad? Pretty young still, I'm guessing. Eddie pointed over at the mound of colorful playthings in her husband's arms. Uh, well... John trailed off. His wife looked on anxiously, as if she were silently apologizing for some unknown transgression. He shook his head at her and muttered, He's an adult, but not mentally, Mr. Paulson. Our son is... Well, he's impaired, and he has severe emotional problems. Arlie takes medications to keep him even, but my insurance only covers so much. And these pills... John's lips thinned into a hard, bitter slash on his face. They cost the earth, these pills. We've been clean out of them for almost three weeks. John swallowed hard and held his hand over his sternum for a moment, grimacing. Eddie recognized these motions, from personal experience, as an acid reflux attack, probably the kind caused by stress. Hewitt groped for words, then stifled a sour belch and simply said, It's been hard on us, Mr. Paulson. The good Lord knows that our little family has known many hardships. Praise him. Praise him. Debbie echoed automatically, and John Hewitt nodded in approval. There was a brief, awkward silence. Eddie was uncertain as to what he should say to the couple, if anything. Should he say that he was sorry? Or would that seem like he was looking down at them in their situation? Should he offer up another praise him to the good man above? And what the hell happened to your wife's ear? But that last bit was none of his concern, was it? Eddie decided that a grave, sympathetic nod would probably be the best way to go. Well, I can tell you that you've got no worries here. You folks are in good hands. I'll be done by the time you get back, and it'll be done right. I've been a mechanic for over 20 years. I know a thing or two about the trade. He winced inwardly as he said this. It was probably just an oil change for Christ's sakes but Eddie wanted to make this strangely uptight couple feel a little easier about at least one of their troubles. Debbie rewarded his efforts with a strained smile. I suppose we'll be on our way then. She cleared her throat and looked at her watch. Mr. Turnbull assured John that you're very good, so I'm sure that we have nothing to worry about. Frank Turnbull was an old friend and faithful customer, and he was the one responsible for this particular referral. John Hewitt worked in the main office of the factory where Frankie spent his days slugging it out on the line. Frankie had overheard Hewitt asking around in the cafeteria if anyone knew of a trustworthy and reasonably priced mechanic. So he'd ambled over to Hewitt's table and volunteered the services of his old pal Eddie Paulson. Referrals were pretty much the only way a rural backyard mechanic such as Eddie could advertise his trade. They were his bread and butter. No, ma'am. Old Frankie didn't steer you wrong. I can guarantee that you have nothing to worry about. Your vehicle will be running like a dream when you get back. A powerful blow against the side of the cargo van cut Eddie off, mid-sentence, and made him jump several inches off the ground. Simultaneously, a grating voice boomed out. Binkle! Arlie wants Binkle! His voice was high-pitched, but at the same time coarse and gravelly. It stabbed Eddie's eardrums and made the hair stand up on his arms. The Hewitts also involuntarily cringed away from it as well, and Eddie thought that he saw fear in their eyes. His smile once again a brittle replica of the real thing. Eddie said, Say, folks, is everything okay? 
both Hewitts ignored him completely. They appeared to be caught in a state of mounting mutual panic. Did you bring Blinkle, John? Please tell me you brought the damn thing. Please. I didn't see it in the van, John hissed back at her. And I didn't know that I was supposed to bring it in the first place. I thought Arlie said that he doesn't like the thing anymore. He loves that thing, John. You know that. Loves it. Debbie shrieked, her eyes wide and wet. Eddie was un Eddie was officially uncomfortable with the situation. He took a few steps back from the couple, his hands held out before him, and tried to think of something he might say to stop the situation from spiraling any further south. What the hell were they going on about anyway? The bellowing thing in the back of the cargo van? That was their son? Paulson opened his mouth to speak, and whomp, another powerful blow against the interior of the GMC made him stumble back and almost fall on his narrow, coverall-clad ass. There was now a large, outward-bulging dent in one of the GMC's rear quarter panels. Eddie gaped at this like a fish. Holy shit, Eddie thought. Did he just do that with his fist? Binkle! Arlie wants Binkle now. What do we do? Debbie asked her husband, and there was no mistaking it. She was panicking. So was he. I don't know, he whispered, and his eyes grew bright with rising tears. I don't know. Eddie tried again. Hey guys, guys, is everything okay? I take it you've lost something. It's a stuffed toy, Debbie said finally noticing him again. Bullwinkle, from that old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon. Could you please look for it, Mr. Paulson, while we deal with this? Please, it might be somewhere in the caravan. Arlie's very attached to it. Okay, sure, no problem. Eddie grinned, and that grin was about as real as a $3 bill. His one and only thought at this point was, go away, you Bible-thumping weirdos, and take whatever's in the back of that GMC with you. Paulson decided, as he ducked into the interior of the caravan, that he would definitely be parking it off his property when he was done. He'd tape a handwritten bill on the windshield, and they could leave his money in the mailbox for all he cared. And fuck Frankie Turnbull. He would have a few choice words for Frankie the next time he saw him. Oh yes indeed. Frankie was going to get an earful. After casting one last cautious glance at the Hewitts, Eddie slid open the minivan side door. Oh, for crying out loud, look at that. Buddy forgot to leave the damn key in the ignition and crammed himself between the two rear bench seats. Keeping an ear open for trouble outside, he blindly groped around beneath the seats, seeking out an object that was soft and plush. Eddie's hand happened upon something sticky. Oh, what the fuck is that? Ew then touched something hard and plastic. It was a G.I. Joe action figure, one of the bad guys. He tossed it aside and thought, this is beyond ridiculous. What the hell am I even doing here? He heard the GMC's side door open and then slam shut. Arlie barked something in a demanding tone. Debbie responded, her voice soft and pleading. Arlie raised his voice into a near shout, loud enough for Eddie to catch a few words. Binkle now, or Arlie? Mama's bad. Right now. Debbie raised her voice as well, and Eddie heard her screech. Don't you do that, Arlie. No, don't you even think about it. From somewhere nearby, John Hewitt shouted, Arlie? You stop it right now, do you hear me? You don't do things like that to your mother or me. Not ever again. Do you understand me, son? His tone was meant to be threatening, but it was not. Hewitt was very, very afraid. Eddie Paulson abruptly understood that the situation with the Hewitts and their son was not merely uncomfortable and weird. It was dangerous. Her black eye. Her ear. 
Eddie pulled himself up from between the seats into a kneeling position so that he could peer out the dusty rear windshield. He saw John striding towards the GMC, stiffly, his arms still full of toys. Hey! Eddie didn't know what was about to happen, but he knew that he didn't want it to happen here, on his property, with him as witness. Nope. You know what? I think maybe you folks ought to get going now, okay? This isn't going to work for me. Arlie let loose a shrill, infuriated bellow, then shrieked, Arlie will bite! Debbie Hewitt screamed, and all hell broke loose. John yelled his wife's name and threw his brightly colored burden into the air, sprinting the last few steps to the van like a track star. The toys arced up and away to either side of him in twin sprays of twinkling plastic and fake fur. They looked, for a moment, like two magical rainbows out of a child's dream. Debbie screamed again, and this time she didn't stop. As John was flinging open the side door of the GMC, Eddie was scuttling ass-first out of the caravan with his heart yammering in his chest and his blood roaring with adrenaline. He seized the first weapon-worthy tool that he laid eyes on a rusted and cobweb-covered pipe wrench that had been leaning up against a wall for an eternity. Outside, John shrieked, Debbie! and dove headfirst into the cacophonous struggle inside with his fist swinging. Paulson ran towards the van at top speed, his pipe wrench raised high in a two-fisted grip and his skinny legs pumping. He was halfway there when Debbie flopped out of the GMC and fell like a ragdoll onto the driveway. The sight of her brought Eddie to a stumbling halt. She was torn and mangled and covered in blood. Covered. There was so much of it that it was impossible to tell where it was even coming from. Debbie had been reduced to a shredded, flailing stick figure, shrieking and dripping crimson. She began to struggle away from the van on her belly, leaving a broad streak of red behind her to mark her progress. It was now John who was screaming inside the van, screaming like an animal caught in the jaws of a trap. His mind reeling from an overload of panicked adrenaline, Eddie darted over to where Debbie was worming along on her belly across the gravel driveway and seized one of her blood slick hands, meaning to drag the injured woman to safety. Come on, let's go! Eddie hollered, and he pulled. And, with a wet little rip, Debbie Hewitt's mutilated arm came off at the shoulder. Eddie stumbled backwards, and this time, he actually fell. His legs were made of water. The pipe wrench dropped from his nerveless fingers. Paulson regarded the wet, chewed-up appendage in his hand for a moment with uncomprehending eyes, then uttered a thin shriek and threw it aside. It landed on his lawn. At that same instant, John lunged halfway out of the van and scrambled at the gravel for purchase, trying to drag himself free of the hulking shadow that loomed behind him. Hewitt's nose and lips were gone. His mouth was a screaming crescent beneath a hollow of churned up meat. The man's hands had been chewed and gnawed into grotesque little stubs. They left bloody smears on the pale gravel stones as they slapped and flailed at the ground. Paulson lurched to his feet, and stumbled over to where the pipe wrench had skidded to a halt in the thin line of creeping Charlie that bordered his driveway. He seized it and whirled around, just in time to witness John being dragged back into the shadowed depths of the cargo van. His legs popped out of the open door and began to vigorously kick at the air. An instant later, Hewitt's fire engine wailing choked off and became a wet, agonized gurgling. John's legs ceased their flailing and stiffened straight out jittering and tremoring midair in a meaningless dance. Eddie knocked the man's legs aside and swung the wrench with everything he had. It thunked into the enormous, slouched backside of the thing that was fastened onto Hewitt's throat, right in the kidney. The hulking thing let out a muffled glurp and raised its head. Blood spilled from its gaping maw in untidy streams. The creature's mouth looked like the yawning entrance to hell lined with a savage jumble of sharp, leaning teeth. Eddie froze. Arlie? He whispered. Arlie blinked at him and sputtered, 
through a mouthful of blood. Hey, that hurt. Arlie's pupils were completely square, like a goat. Eddie let out a roar that was more terror than bravery and swung the pipe wrench again, as hard as he could, straight at the monstrosity's gigantic skull. It whistled through the air like a warhead and whap, it stopped dead in the middle of a ham-sized fist. Arlie snarled. No, you are bad. And ripped the wrench out of Paulson's death grip with a slight jerk of his massive wrist. Eddie's little finger got caught in the hole at the bottom of the handle and snapped sideways at a 90 degree angle. Right before the second knuckle. Crack. He barely even felt it. He was already running for the closest possible shelter. His garage. Arlie let out a phlegm-choked growl behind him and gave chase. Paulson could actually hear and feel the monstrosity's approach. It was like being chased by an enraged rhinoceros with the taste for blood. Paulson ran into the garage and went to lunge for the caravan's passenger side door, but there was no time to jump in. Arlie's bellowing shadow was almost upon him. Instead, he scampered to the front of the van and... With an athletic grace born out of mortal terror, he dove feet first into the narrow space between the bumper and the edge of the pit. Hewitt had pulled the van a little too far ahead, leaving a gap that was slightly too small for even Eddie's thin frame. He cruelly scraped his entire backside against the rough concrete edge of the pit and slammed his forehead off of the bumper. Paulson went limp and landed on his left ankle, forcing it to roll into an unnatural angle. Crack. Eddie's fibula snapped. It made the flang of his back seem insignificant in comparison. The mechanic screamed and instinctively lunged away from the unbearable blast of agony in his ankle. He rammed the top of his head into the oil pan, and stars exploded across his vision, a galaxy of brilliant stars. Eddie was unconscious before his face hit the hard floor of the pit. For a long while, his world was nothing more than black and silence. 